the perfect God. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, that has sounded like a pipe dream. I mean, the perfect God, but our concept of God is pretty important. When I was a young person, I remember as a teenager thinking, God's going to get me. I mean, at some point, it's going to catch up to me. I mean, God has got to be looking to ruin my good time. And then as I got more religious and more religious, it seemed that the concept of God got worse, not better. I mean, I was so afraid of the God's going to get you concept that anytime I had a headache, a physical ailment, something went wrong in my life, I thought it was God. I thought my headaches were God. I thought my ailments were God. I thought everything that I experienced in the negative, God must be angry at me. At least He's frustrated at me. That's why He's brought these things into my life. And maybe, maybe you've struggled with your concept of God. You know, you lose your job, or you lose your spouse, or you may even lose a child. You lose something in your life, and it seems like the first thought that grabs us is, maybe God's trying to tell me something. Have you ever thought that? Maybe God's trying to tell me there's something wrong with me and that's why these bad things are happening to me. God's trying to get my attention. He's trying to bring me to repentance. He's trying to scourge me with His discipline. So because this and this and this have happened, maybe it's Christian karma, God is really ticked off at me. Have you found yourself thinking a version of that at some point in your life? Can you see that if you have the very life of God inside of you, it might be kind of important to know whether that life is good, whether God is good, and how He treats you? Otherwise, your expectations are all over the place Planet Earth comes at you, you begin to interpret that as God every single time. The woman is killed at the street corner. Your pet dies. Coronavirus. Hurricane Katrina. I mean, we can go on and on, and we have even seen our very own preachers out there get on America's airwaves and say, God's trying to tell you something, Louisiana. God's trying to tell you something, New York. God's trying to tell you something, United States. God's sending you a message through this disaster. This is God. I mean, I've heard it plain and straightforward just like that. And I'm sure you have too. God's trying to get us to confess our sins. And if we just would get down on the ground and confess our sins then this would all go away. You'd no longer be sick. We'd no longer have coronavirus. Everything would be better. No more disaster. No more pandemic. No more this. No more that. You know what that's called? It's called heaven. That's what that's called. (laughs) So what is your concept of God? If Christ lives in you, what is He like? What is He up to? What is He thinking? What does He think of you? What's His agenda? Can you not see that we can talk about the perfect you, but without understanding the perfect God who lives in you, we're still out of whack, aren't we? Do you see God as being only as good to you as you are to Him? Do you realize that many of us, we get stuck in that rut without even realizing it? We take our behavior and actually make that into a mirror, and then start believing that about God. God is as good to me as I am to Him. Oh, God is good generically, but I've been disappointing Him lately, so He's equally frustrated. I've been performing poorly, therefore He is proportionally angry. Do you see how we can do this? Have you ever said to your husband or wife or friend or someone in your family, What's wrong? Are you mad at me? And they say, huh? What are you talking about? And then you say, are you mad at me because I did X, Y, and Z? Oh, no, I hadn't even thought about that. 
Has that ever happened to you? And so you assumed that that person in their, perhaps in their silence, perhaps in that neutral face they wore, that somehow what you had noticed about you was exactly what they were thinking about you. And then later on you found out nothing could be more untrue. It wasn't even on their minds. Can you relate to that, anybody? Yeah. Yeah. So now, do you see how we could be tempted then to do this very same thing with the God of the universe? I've got my performance on my mind, and I assume he does too, even though he says he keeps no record of my wrongs. And so I start to believe that God is only as good to me as I am to him in my behavior. So common. It hits us every day. We might think thoughts like this, I wonder when the hammer will drop. God, you're not going to let it be this smooth for too long. I'm sure you've got something coming through the side door. You're going to wreck me, break me, or teach me a lesson soon. We start looking at God like he's the school principal or someone who's been strict in our lives. We keep waiting for, us, for him to teach us something. We're so ready for him to just teach us who we really are. Push us down, get us in a corner, teach us who we are. Because we're ugly and rotten and he knows it and he just wants us to know it. And then we come back to our identity in Christ, holy and blameless and righteous. And that just becomes Bible talk for Sunday morning. The goodness of God matters. How He treats you is important. And so we're always looking for the hammer to drop, and yet God tells us in Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts. You know, that's what's so fun about hanging around people that are smarter than you, you know? I love hanging around a bunch of geniuses in a particular area. You start picking up stuff, and their thoughts are not your thoughts, right? You know what I'm talking about? You get the counsel of many in an area that you know nothing about, and their thoughts are not your thoughts. And it's awesome. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So maybe, just maybe, we are to trust Him, but not necessarily understand Him. Does that make sense? It shouldn't. (laughs) He doesn't always make sense to us, does He? God, why'd you let this happen? Why do you let this go on? Why do these people who don't even know you get to experience this Why are you showing such mercy to these when I am your child? Things don't seem to make sense sometimes. But we're to trust Him, not necessarily understand Him. You know, Adam and Eve struggled with this. Do you remember the story in the garden? I mean, their struggle was, is God good? That's really what they wrestled with, is God good? Because, see, they bought the lie that God was maybe holding out on them, right? I mean, they had it perfect. They were innocent and perfect and blameless. The garden was beautiful. What was not to like? They had the best existence they could possibly have. And what was the thought that got them? You know what? I mean, maybe it could be better around here. Maybe it could be better, is God holding out on me, which is an accusation against God, is God good? And so they ate so that they would have knowledge, so they could then determine, is God good or not? Has God been holding out on me? I need to know with some criteria so I can measure God's idea of good. And then I'll have my own conclusion that I can draw. Sound familiar? The world is full of it today. I draw my own conclusion of what is good. Relative truth. Oh, that's good for you. This is good for me. Oh, is that good for you? Oh, great. I'm so glad you're happy. 
And we have relative truth as each one of us measures what's good and what's evil. And then everybody ends up with a different measure, don't they? That was the first sin in the garden, grabbing hold of our own determination of what is good. And they made a decision that maybe God wasn't as good as he portrayed himself to be. So we're going to hedge our bet and get into this knowledge of goodness so that we can get a better state. God's holding out. And isn't that what sin is today? The one who has an affair. The one who decides that they need to crush other people in order to build themselves up. The one who criticizes or pushes down so they can be seen in a better light. I mean, isn't that what sin is? My state isn't good enough. And so I need to better my state. I need to better my condition. And and so we see then they were suckers for this sales pitch. And if we're not careful... We fail to believe that God is good, and then we fail to believe that we're complete in Him. We fail to believe that He's not holding out on us. We've got it as good as it gets. He is good. But here's 9-11. The terrorists fly airplanes into buildings. Here's Hurricane Katrina, a natural disaster that hits the shores of the southern United States. And of course, coronavirus, very fresh in our minds. Uh, My friend was on a phone call, and it was with other pastors, and it was at the beginning of the coronavirus. And the other pastors had concluded, literally, in order, sort of like I have listed here, one of them, dozens of pastors on a conference call, one of them said, well, I think we just need to confess our sins as a nation, and God will remove this. So... It's you and your sins. That's that's the reason this is happening. Someone else said, well, you know, this is kind of like a scourge of discipline. I mean, this is God disciplining our land because we have drifted away from our Christian values. And so God's idea of disciplining a nation that is drifting is to kill them with a virus. And everybody seemed okay with that. Dozens of pastors from around the country. God's trying to grab our attention, someone else said. He wants the church to lead, and He's trying to grab our attention. What kind of father grabs your attention by injecting you with a virus? Hello? Let's call Child Protective Services. (laughs) And yet, this has become the norm. This is the normal rhetoric when bad things happen. And let me tell you, friends, it is the easiest sermon to preach. Right? Find a bunch of misery, pile on, tell people they could do better, and then it'll go away. There's nothing to that sermon. There's no investigation needed. There's no inquiry into God's Word needed. Just find people that are miserable, find people that are suffering, and tell them it's their fault. Sound familiar? It's Job's friends. They preached a sermon on that, didn't they? Right in Job's ears. And so... We have to see that when God wants to get our attention, look how He does it. 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you. Look at this. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So, is God ending people's lives early? No, he doesn't want anyone to perish. You say, well, what about in the Old Testament? Yeah, under the law there were consequences for sin and there was a protection of Israel and a protection of the line of Judah and the protection of Jesus so that the great plan would go forward. Yes, absolutely. Sodom and Gomorrah, the flood, we could go on and on, but we're not under that Old Testament era. We live in a new covenant, don't we? So can we talk about today, today is the day of salvation. Somebody says, well no, let's go to the book of Revelation. I mean in the book of Revelation there's a final judgment and there's fire and destruction and people are punished. Yes, but that's not today either. 
That's the day of judgment. Today is the day of salvation. So why are we telling people that God is killing their friends and relatives and trying to get people's attention through death and disaster and virus and everything else? Why are we telling people that when God says He wants none to perish and all to believe? Today's the day of salvation. We have the best message on the planet and we're ruining it. We're missing our chance by making God into a death dealer instead of a life giver. 1 Timothy chapter 2, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Someone called into the radio recently, I don't know I don't know if I'm chosen. I don't know if I'm one of the elect. My thought is, well, how could you? How could you know? If, you, if it was just some people that God wanted to save, then how could you know you were one of those? But it is a passage like this where we see that God so loved the world. God wants all people to be saved. He wants none to perish. This is real. This is his character. This is his heart. This is his agenda. You can know that he was standing at the door of your heart and knocking because he stands at the door of every heart and knocks. So you don't have to be one of the special elite frozen chosen. You can know that God wants all people to be saved. And that's part of His goodness. And that's His agenda. And it's good. So does God bring disaster upon us to drive more people to repentance? Well, look at Romans chapter 2. Paul says, Do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience Not knowing the kindness of God leads you to repentance. So what gets us there? Well, it's the kindness of God that gets our attention. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So I know you grew up and they wanted your attention, so they yelled and screamed, and sometimes it wasn't pretty. But that doesn't make it God. They yelled and they screamed and they said things and they, maybe they even cursed at you and they said this and that until they got your attention. But it's the kindness of God that gets your attention. So how do we understand God? I mean, in the midst of crisis. I mean, we just came out of a big crisis. Many of us were still in it around the world. You look at India, it's not pretty. How do we understand God in the midst of crisis? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. We look to Jesus. What did he say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we can trust that. Jesus is a truth teller. He says if you've seen him, you're looking straight at the Father. That's what he's like. So let's check out Jesus for a minute. John 14, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? In other words, seriously, people? I mean, that's what he's saying. I'm right here. You keep saying, show us the Father. He's standing right in front of you in exact representation. Every bit of his character, every ounce of who he is, is standing before you. Don't miss him. Don't miss his goodness. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact, look at this, exact representation of his being Sustaining all things by His powerful Word. What is God like? He is exactly like Jesus. Now, did Jesus run around killing people? Huh, that's enlightening. Did Jesus run around just absolutely injecting people with viruses, making people sick to try to get their attention? That's interesting. If you've seen Him, you've seen the Father. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. That's Jesus in His own words. This comes right after John 3.16. 
God so loved the world. And then, by the way, I didn't come to bash the world. I didn't come to judge the world. Now, that's interesting because we call ourselves Christians, right? We're Christians. Are you a Christian? Well, if you're a Christian, then Christ says that he didn't come to judge the world. He didn't come to condemn the world. So it's kind of wasting your breath as you do this and this and this at a dead world instead of telling them, come on, Jesus wants to save you, not condemn you. Come on, welcome into the fold. Jesus wants to save, not condemn. But if all we have to say is, look at you, you miserable wretch. Look at you, you dirty, rotten sinner. Look at you and your performance then we are not representing the agenda of Christ, even though we're Christians. Do you see it? God didn't send His Son to condemn the world, but to save. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. John 12. While the sun was setting... All those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to Jesus and laying his hands on each one of them, what was he doing? He was healing them. They were sick and he brought healing. Not the opposite. Not striking with disease, but healing. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father. This was the Father's agenda This was Jesus' agenda. This is God's heart in your life. Now, Jesus could not put it any plainer. The way that I put it is planet Earth comes at you and Christ is working in you. Planet Earth is ugly. Christ is beautiful. And they are not the same thing. Tragedy comes at you. The triumph of Jesus lives in you. Horrible pain comes your direction, and yet the comforter dwells inside. Those are two different things. Jesus says it this way, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Do you see the contrast? Take heart, I've overcome the world. So Jesus calls it. I mean, in this world, you'll have trouble coming at you, planet Earth. And yet, in Him, you'll have peace working in you. Those are two different things. What happens to us when our mindset gets warped is we mash the two together. I lost my job. God is ticked. I lost my spouse. God's trying to tell me something. I lost my, and you fill in the blank, God must be, and you fill in the blank. And the enemy has a heyday with that stuff, man. That is accusation central. And so Jesus differentiates so that we can see fallen world, risen Christ. Two different things. God is not a death dealer. He is a life giver. Amen? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion. Look at this. The God of all comfort. What's He doing? He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. But friends, you can't do this. You can't do this if you believe that double talk. You're going to tell somebody, oh, I'm so sorry this happened. God must be trying to... And then five minutes later, you're supposed to comfort them when you just told them God did it. Oh, God did it, but let me comfort you with God. God came around the front, hurled this at you, but now He's coming around the back to be your comforter. Do you see it? It's absolute confusion. It's double talk. And it's making God into... A two-faced deity when he's already told us, you want to see the face of God? Look to Jesus. What about 2 Chronicles 7.14? 
Because this is the one, right? I mean, this is the one that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, you know this verse, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. This is the one they haul out. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, bad stuff has happened and this thing gets hauled out over and over and over. You've seen it, right? All right, well, here's something interesting about it. In the same passage, uh, I don't know if it matters, but 22,000 oxen are killed for their sins. Jesus died for our sins. In the same passage, 120,000 sheep were killed for the sins of Israel. Jesus died for our sins. And the temple, in the same passage, was consecrated for the people of Israel. And now we're the temple. We live under a new covenant with Christ living in us. So I don't know about you, but maybe, just maybe, that's a little bit of context. Plus, get this, the, the passage said... That we had to seek Him. Well, we don't have to seek Him. We found Him. The passage said that He hears from heaven. Well, God doesn't just hear from heaven. He lives in us. And the passage said we would be forgiven and healed. That Israel would be forgiven and healed if they would just do this. Well, God has already forgiven us. He's already healed us spiritually, hasn't He? So maybe, just maybe, oh, I don't know. We ought to consider the Old Testament context of this and then call ourselves New Testament believers. But when we take a passage intended for Israel and then we make it about the United States 2,000 years later, do you see how messed up that is? Because today, every believer in the USA and every believer around the world, we live on this side of the cross. We live on this side of the resurrection. We have been forgiven. Christ lives in us. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing. We don't have to fear curses. We don't have to wonder about our forgiveness. We don't have to wonder if God might hear us. There is no if. It's done. So what about this Christian karma? I mean, we wouldn't call it that, but that's what we're tempted to believe, right? I mean, what goes around comes around. I sinned, so God's going to get me. Man, that is what I call watering down the wages. The wages of sin is death. And we keep trying to say the wages of sin is God is ticked off at me for 20 minutes until I get up and have my quiet time. God is ticked off at me until I do my 1 John 1, 9, and then finally He's okay. God is completely miffed at me and frustrated at me until I do this mental gymnastics of asking him for forgiveness, waiting for a feeling, hoping that same feeling will come, and ta-da, I'm cleansed and God's okay. But wait a minute, Romans 5 says we have peace with God. And if I were going to get the wages of sin, it wouldn't be God being angry for 12 minutes. It would be God killing me. But Jesus died. He took the wages There are no wages left. There is no Christian karma. The cross destroyed the karma. So then, what about the day of judgment? Well, we already said today's not that day, but it's coming. I mean, the day of judgment is coming. What should we we believe about it? Well, it's interesting. 2 Peter 3 says this, By His word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved. God's not bringing destruction yet. They're reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of who? Not the church, but ungodly men. Now, I just want you to notice the words reserved and kept. Because today's not that day. God is not doing things to the earth to send the earth a message. The earth is kept and reserved for a day when it will be destroyed by fire. Yes, destroyed by fire, but today is not that day. Today is the day of salvation. And that's why we have the best message on the planet. It's a message of rescue. 1 John 4, God's love is perfected with us 
so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. As Jesus is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in this kind of love. Perfect love from God casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Now, do you see that? I mean, what he's saying is, if you're afraid of the day of judgment, it's because you've imagined the movie screen. There is no movie. He destroyed the real. If you're afraid, you're imagining the wages of sin, but Jesus already died. There are no wages. If you're fearing, it's because you're asking, is God good? And that question is not good enough. The question is not, is God good? The question is, is God perfect? It's black and white. Is God perfect and does He have perfect love for you? Because if God has perfect love for you, guess what happens to the fear? She gone. Right? I mean, if God has perfect love for you, there's no room for fear. Now, if God kind of loves you, He kind of likes you, but there's this behavior issue, see, then that's gray, and I wrestle, and the accusation comes, and I'm not sure. So this has to be black and white. It's perfect love, not partial love, that casts out fear. We'll finish with this, Psalm 34 I asked you at the beginning, is God good? It says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. The question at the outset, is God good? And then the question became, is God perfect? And really, the question is, does God treat you perfectly? And when you look at 1 Corinthians 13, you know that that famous passage that we look at during a wedding ceremony. It's recited and we're sitting in our seat taking notes on how to be a better husband, be a better wife. Yeah, love is patient, love is kind. Okay, I'll try that this Monday. Uh, You see what we do? We we create a laundry list of things that we got to try to do. And you know what it actually says there? There aren't verbs. Love is not a verb there. Love is a noun. And it says love is something you possess. And we know that God is love, that Christ is love. So we possess A God who is patient, a God who is kind, a God who keeps no record of our wrongs. What we're seeing basically is God is nice. I know that sounds really sweet and too good to be true, but what do you call a person that is not rude, that keeps no record of your wrongs, that is patient and kind toward you? Would you call them nice? I mean, I would call them nice. Now, it's because of the cross and resurrection, it's because of Jesus that we've entered into this beautiful treatment. But let's just say it, God is nice. He's nice. And I use that word on purpose because I know that we'll wrestle with it. We can say, God is good from the Bible, but God is nice. Ah, That just sounds like feel good. Yes, it feels good. It feels good to know the God that is nice. It feels good to know the God that is good and good to you all the time and keeps no record of your wrongs and is never rude to you and is not trying to break you but build you up, not trying to crush you but make sure that you're planted and rooted in Him. God is good. God is nice. He is kind to you. Because of Jesus, we get this beautiful treatment From a father who does not abuse us. He loves us beyond measure. He even likes us. This is important. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We we do wrestle with it. We see bad things happening. We want to read the tea leaves. We see bad things happen and we're looking for a message from you. Thank you for reminding us today that the message has been sent. That you already demoed your love for us through Christ. The message has been delivered. You love us. You like us. You're good. You're kind. 
You're even nice to us. You're not an abuser. You're not a death dealer. You're a life giver. We love you, Father. We thank you. We trust you. We believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen.